I want to be a blessing to you today. But I realize that in order sometimes to be a blessing, we hear things sometimes we don't want to hear. Um, but let, we'll get to that in a minute. Turn to Galatians chapter 6 with me in your Bible. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. You, somebody say it's warm in here? Okay. I thought I heard somebody say it's hot in here. It may get warmer. <laughs> Galatians chapter 6. Um, and then when you found that, go ahead and pull my coat off speaking of that. Uh, when you found that, I have another text for you to turn to as well. And it's in Hosea. I have a secondary text in Hosea chapter 10. So after you found Galatians chapter 6 and you've got your finger there, I want you to take something in your Bible, whether it be your finger, whether it be a bookmark, whether it be a gum wrapper, whatever you got, business card or fingernail file, makes no difference to me, but stick it there in Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. So Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 and following, and then our secondary text is Hosea chapter 10 verse 12 and 13. Okay, give you just a minute or two to find that, and then we're gonna hit the ground running, and we got a ways to go. So we're gonna we're gonna get it done. I want your attention all the way through, though. Please do every bit you can. I know you barely stayed up late last night watching westerns, and you barely keep your eyes open this morning, or or whatever it was. But whatever you're doing, but let's try our best to to get this because I'm telling you, God has some help for you. I I, I can't tell you the last time I sat through a message. And I went through the spectrum of emotions the way I did sitting through this one. God, God really, he spoke to me. And I hope he spoke to, speaks to you this morning. We're going to pray for that. So, all right, Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, we're going to read this morning. Okay, have you found that? All right, well, let's read that. Galatians 6, 1 through 9. The Bible says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a... Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And we're going to look at that one verse there in Hosea, or actually two verses there in Hosea. So flip over there. I want you to read those along with me as, as we read them there. Hosea 10, 12, and 13, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way and in the multitude of thy mighty men. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, Lord, I come before you, and I need you. Lord, I, I need you so much today. Lord, I want to com convey this message to your people. Lord God, they need it. Lord, just like I needed it. Father, every child of God needs this message. And, Lord, I know it's not an easy message to receive. Lord, it's going to hurt. I know that it will. But, Lord, we're going to rip that Band-Aid off even though it's going to sting. We're going to, we're going to address it even though, Lord, it's not going to feel good as we address it. But, Lord God, I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you do a work in our hearts, that you, that you help us, Lord, to understand your word, and, Lord, to uh, get in line with it, Lord, and live by it. And, Lord, not, not buck up against it, but, Father, realize that it's your word and it's law. It's what you say. And you're not going to change it for us or anybody else. So, Lord, help us to get in line with you. 
and be willing to be obedient to your word. Father, I'm so grateful for your love and mercy. I'm so grateful for Jesus. I'm thankful for the blood that washed my sins away. I'm thankful, Lord, that my account is clear and clean before you because of what Jesus has done for me. And, Father, I pray this morning you communicate this message clearly into the hearts of your beloved people, Lord, and we'll give you all the glory and the praise and honor for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. My text this morning is is verse 8 in Galatians chapter 6. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You know something that really unnerves me? is unpredictable people. People that you can't count on. People that people that you don't ever know when you see them if they're going to be friendly to you and shake your hand, be glad to see you, or if they're going to bite your head off. You don't ever know what you're going to get. Some people are like that. Hard to count on kind of people like that because, again, you never know what you're going to get. The people that I admire the most in life are the ones that you can count on to be the same. Rain or shine, good or bad, they're the same people. I had a, I had a papaw like that. And and matter of fact, I had two papaws like that, and they were the same person. No matter when I saw them, they never changed. They didn't they didn't go up and down. They were they had found balance and were steady in their life. And I and I admire that. That's what I that's what I would like to attain to be. Because un, unpredictable people scare me. They really do. You you just never know what you're going to get from them. And uh, aren't you glad God isn't like that? Aren't you glad that aren't you glad God didn't just change his mind and say, I think I'm gonna send so many people to hell today? You know, I'm sick of them. Aren't you glad God didn't wake up? He don't wake up. Amen. Aren't you glad God didn't wake up? Amen. God doesn't never wake up. He's always awake. He's always in charge. Uh God doesn't change. Aren't you glad of that? I am. I'm thankful God doesn't change because if God changed, he might look at me different one day and then it'd be over. But God doesn't change. Matter of fact, he, he doesn't change. We have a word for that in the Bible that we use. It's called immutable. It means God can't be any different than he is. The Bible says, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. God doesn't change. Our immutable God is, in fact, so sure of what he's going to do that he wrote it down for us in the Bible, and he sticks with what he wrote down. Isn't that something? Hallelujah. And not only that, God gave you a written contract, a copy of a written contract between you and him, which says, if you do this, I'll do that. And you got it in your lap right now. Isn't that something? You have his written word that he will never back up on what he says he will do. Never. Amen? Now, that's comforting to me. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room has heard somebody preach from my text before. And and preach that that preaching that warns the sinner that God's gonna send him to hell for his sins. For if you sow to the flesh, you shall love the flesh, reap corruption. Sinner, God is gonna get you for your sins. I'm sure you've heard somebody preach that. But, but if we tell the absolute truth, that's not what our text is saying at all. You see. Context is king when you're reading the Bible. Context is king. A text without the proper context is a pretext. You can make it say anything you want it to say, okay? But when you take the verse in context, then you know the actual meaning. So I want you to look at verse 1 of our of our chapter, okay? Look at verse 1 and look at the first word. What is that first word? Brethren, Brethren Okay. So who is this addressed to? The saints of God. You're right. This is not addressed to lost sinners at all. This is addressed to the Lord's church. So he says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. Okay, so he's talking to brethren in the church. So Galatians 6 is not a threat to the unbeliever, right? It's an explanation to the believer. It's what it, it's what Galatians six is. It's not intended to terrify a lost sinner at all. It's intended to help a born again child of God 
understand what's happening in their life since they've gotten saved. Paul is demonstrating how a supernatural process is very similar to a natural process, the process of sowing and reaping. I want to give you some thoughts on sowing and reaping this morning. If you got a pen, you need to write these down. These will help you later on. Okay? That's what we're talking about this morning is the principle of sowing and reaping. Number one, you will always reap like you sow. You will always reap like you sow. Whatever you plant is what you're going to reap. You will never plant sweet potato slips and get watermelons. It just won't happen. I guarantee you, no matter how many times you do it, you will never get watermelons off the sweet potato slips. Okay? You plant purple hull peas, you're not going to get English peas. You won't get butter beans. You won't get tomatoes or collards or, or, or sugar cane, for that matter. You're going to get purple hull peas. Okay? And now listen to what I'm saying before we all entertain ourselves about gardens in our head. If we sow in the area of sexual you will reap in the area of sexual sin. If you sow in the area of your mind, you will reap in the area of your mind. The Bible is very clear. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, Preacher, I don't have many areas of grave or tra tragic sins in my life. And maybe you don't, and that's great, and hallelujah for that. But the areas that you have sinned, the areas where you do have sin in your life, you will reap. That's a fact. That's a guaranteed fact. Number two, not only will you always also always reap like you sow, but number two, you will always reap larger than you sow. Larger than you sow. How many of y'all here by show of hands know how big a tomato seed is? Y'all, the rest of y'all ain't never seen a tomato seed in your life? How many of y'all ever cut a tomato? How many of y'all looked at a tomato seed inside a tomato? Okay, we've all seen a tomato seed. Maybe it wasn't dry, maybe it was still juicy, but we've all seen a tomato seed, okay? Wouldn't do much good on a salad, would it? That wouldn't help you out much on a salad, a tomato seed, would it? No. There ain't much eating one tomato seed. But if you plant one tomato seed into some good ground, it'll reproduce many, 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 many times over. You'll get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of seeds. When you sow to your flesh, you're going to reap much larger than you have sown. And you know what? We have a we have a generation of people, young people coming up around us, who have sowed tremendously to their flesh. Tremendously. Most most people look at what's going on today and scratch their heads as to how or, or why all this stuff is happening in our world. Consider how the last few generations have sown to their flesh. Consider the hippie generation. Consider the selfish me generation of the 70s. Consider the overindulgence of the 80s. The vapid, uh, I don't care about nothing attitude of the 90s. And it's not gotten any better. This next generation is going to truly reap what they have sown. Number three, not only will you reap more than you've sown, you'll always reap longer than you've sown. You plant a single tomato seed, right? even right now, you can still plant it. But you plant a single tomato seed in the spring, and you know what will happen? It will continue to produce tomatoes all the way to frost. You're going to get a lot more than you sow. It only, I mean, you, you just walked out there in the yard and stuck it in the ground and covered it up. It took you a second. It didn't take long at all. But for months and months and months, you're going to continue to reap tomatoes. You sow to your flesh. It may, it may only took a minute to sow to your flesh, but and it may seem like nothing. But count on the fact that it will reap corruption a lot longer than you sowed it. Number four. <clears throat> You'll reap later than you sowed. Now, I plant I plant my 
stuff. I hadn't planted a garden in, in several years. I planted this, that, and the other, but I have had years where I planted, tried to plant a full garden. I planted one of my mama's half. I had five or six big long rows of garden that I was trying to grow. But you know something about when I plant seeds? Get impatient. Then I go out there a day or two later, and I'm like, hey, nothing come up here. What in the world? Man, I planted that. It should have come up now. It's rained. I mean, it ought to come up. What's going on, you know? I, I don't. I'm, I'm. I'm. I'm not very patient with it. I like for it to happen. You know, we live in a fast-paced, instant gratification world. You know, we get uh, and we get impatient waiting for things to happen. I know because there's some people probably thinking, you know, I did all kind of horrible, mean, nasty things before I got saved, and and nothing that you're talking about, none of those things you're talking about like that ever happened to me. Yet, yet. I want to help you with something this morning. I want to help you this morning understand what may be going on in your life. Paul writes there in chapter 6, verse 8, He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Now hear what I'm about to say. That's a very narrow spectrum of sin he's referring to. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Now, the same man that wrote chapter 6 here, he's also responsible for writing chapter 5, right? Okay, so in chapter 5, verse 19, he writes this. Now, the works of the flesh, we just referred to the flesh. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And he's going to give them to us. Adultery. Fornication, which we've talked about for the last two weeks, which the Greek word is pornea, which means all manner of lewdness, all manner of illicit sexual things. Uncleanness, which is just bad morals. Lasciviousness, which is unbridled lewdness or lust or giving in to sexual things and being lewd. Uh, I'll give you an example. The men outside Lot House, let them out here that we may know them. Lewd, uh, lasciviousness, idolatry, putting things before God in our life, witchcraft, and witchcraft is, is where we get the word pharmacia, and I think there's a lot of the drug industry that's related to a bunch of witchcraft, and I believe God, if we dug into that, we'd find more of that, but you look at all this stuff that's going on with it, with, with the methamphetamines and fentanyl and all the opioid crisis, all the junk going on in our country, that's witchcraft. Hatred, variance, which means being somebody that's argumentative all the time, just want to argue with you all the time. God calls that a sin of the flesh. Emulations, which is contention, which is always causing trouble, always picking a fight, always always arguing. Wrath, which is violent anger. Strife, contending against God. You're, you're not letting God work in your life, you're fighting him. Seditions, which is cliques or factions. When, when you, you got your little group and, and you think you know better than everybody else and y'all are better than everybody else, listen, heresies, which is dissension, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, which is drunken parties, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? Now, I got news for you. If you're in chapter 5, then you're also in chapter 6. Now, I know. You say, well, I, I got saved. I know. Paul said, and such were some of you. He said that in First Corinthians. And such were some of you. Maybe you used to be that way. Okay? I used to. I lived like a devil before I got saved. Man, I was wild. I parted. I was crazy. And I was. I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud of that at all. Because I am over in chapter 5, I find myself in chapter 6. If you were ever in chapter 5, you will find yourself in chapter 6. There are some unpleasant truths about sowing and reaping. And God's people need some help on this subject. And I'm going to give it to you this morning. Again, it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be enjoyable. But by the time we're done, I think it will help you. Because if you sow to your flesh, you are going to reap corruption. Like I said earlier, 
God has a written contract with us. It's right there in the Bible. It's the Word of God. That's what it is. And he is going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. God ain't going to change what he put in his word just because you don't like it. Just because it's uncomfortable for you, God is not going to change this. Let me give you an explanation of what happens a lot of the time. Somebody gets saved, and they start coming to church regularly. They're happy in Christ. They're excited at having eternal life. They're fellowshipping with other Christians at church. They're having the best time. They're, they're starting to give. They're starting to they're sing and know the songs, and, and, and things are going good in their life. And then something terrible happens. And they begin to question, well, why in the world would God let this happen to me? I'm serving him now. And ain't like I used to be. I'm not out there in the world like I was anymore. I'm serving God. My family's in church. We're giving. We're trying to reach people for Jesus, trying to reach out to other people. I don't understand why this stuff's happening to me. I thought I got saved. You did. You know, things things like unplanned pregnancies happen. Preacher, I got saved and I cleaned my life up and everything, but I just found out I'm pregnant and I'm not married. God's not going to take that baby away. He's not going to take that pregnancy away just because you got saved. Say, Preacher, I, 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 everybody, I got saved. My life's going good, but I just lost my job. Something they found out about my past. Preacher, I, I, I'm living for God now, but my kids, my kids are all going astray. They're going crazy, and I don't understand why. Why are my kids serving God? I'm serving God now. What's going on? Preacher, I'm trying to live for God. And my, my wife just filed for divorce. My husband just filed for divorce. I'm trying to live for God. I'm serving him. Why is these things happening to me? Or maybe it's, Preacher, I've been serving God for a while now. They just uncovered something I did in my past. It proved it's me, and I want to go to jail. I know a preacher that happened to I'm a preacher that happened to him. Something happened in his past. Boy, he was, boy, he was saved. Boy, he was a preacher. Caught up to him. He went to jail. You know, people go through things like that, and they say, you know, I thought God forgave me for all those things. I thought he washed my sins away. Why, preacher? Why? 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 Why is these things happening to me? He that sows to his flesh shall love the flesh, reap corruption. It's an unconditional statement. Like I said, if you can find yourself in chapter 5, sow into your flesh, then you will find yourself in chapter 6, reaping corruption. And let me just say to you, God's not being mean to you when he causes you to reap corruption. God, God's not abusing you. God's not mishandling you. He's not mistreating you in any way. He's given us plenty of warnings in the Word against these things. And again, this message is not a feel-good message. It's a serious, somber, sobering, fearful message. And it will get scary and dark before it gets better. But praise God, it will get better at the end. Amen? Like I said in Sunday school, but I'm going to say it again. i got people who wasn't here in Sunday school. Our nature is not to pay attention until we have to. We, we, we'll ignore it. We'll ignore the warnings until we absolutely have to. We usually remain stupid until pain gets involved. And then all of a sudden we get smart. Let me give you some examples. By show of hands this morning, how many of us in our childhood put something electrical, I mean, put something metal into an electrical outlet? Stephen did. I did too. How many of y'all did? No, that's what, nobody else? Robert has. He didn't want to admit it. <laughs> Hurt, didn't it? But you didn't do it twice, did you? I didn't either. Okay. How many of us reached up and touched the hot stove? I did too. You think I learned on the electrical outlet, but no, I touched the hot stove. Let me ask you this one. How many of you punched that little thing down in the little ashtray in the car, the cigarette lighter, and then watched it glow and turn back, sorry, the red went away and you touched it? And you got a burn on your finger or something. Uh-huh. See, a bunch of us done that. See, y'all thought I didn't, you thought I'd missed you, but I got every one of us just about, right? Okay. 
You thought it was okay to touch it, but see, again, it wasn't, and you you paid for it. Just as sure as you touched it, it burned. You could say, "Oh, I didn't mean to do that," and it didn't burn no more. No, it burned because what happens? You get a you get an immediate reaction. Well, God, God's going to give you a re- He's going to give you a reaction. It may not be immediate, but He's going to give you the reaction. See, God. Here's the thing: God will give you mercy to endure what you have to reap. And with God's mercy, you can reap any corruption that you have to reap. God's Word, look here, God's Word is filled with God's words. And God's words are perfect. God's perfect and His Word is perfect. And He chooses the perfect words to teach us what He's trying to say to us. God did not make a mistake when He chose the word corruption. Because You know why? Because he's not discuss, discussing forgiveness. He's discussing corruption. There is a great big difference between corruption and forgiveness. <clears throat> he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. There's four major differences between forgiveness and corruption. You want to write these down too. It'll help you. Forgiveness is spiritual. Corruption is physical, okay? Forgiveness is spiritual. Corruption is physical. You can reap corruption in your body while your heart is right with God. You still have to live through it, but you can have a heart right with God while you live through it. Second of all, forgiveness is immediate and spontaneous when I confess. But corruption is usually delayed and comes in the future. God, forgive me for what I did. And God says, okay, I forgive you. But that don't mean my corruption is going to show up immediately. It may, it may be way off. Still right, and I'm going to give her a second. <laughs> Number three. Forgiveness is eternal. Corruption is temporary. How long is God going to forgive me and you? Tell me. Forever. I don't know why we waited to say that. Amen. We know that. God's going to forgive us forever. Right? God's unconditional promises concerning sowing and reaping are universal to every one of his children. They're not some who get out of it and some who don't. God does not take away corruption when he saves you. You know, there's still a lot of people in this world who are begging God to forgive them for corruption. They're suffering through something that they did because of something they did that God's already forgiven them for, and and they're begging God to forgive them for what they're going through. That's not how that's supposed to work. Once you understand this, it changes the way you view things. Praying for forgiveness for corruption is a waste of your time. Because you don't have to... God doesn't need to forgive you for what he's allowing you to go through as a result of what you did. You're just having to live through it. It's the result. Let me give you a simple, easy way of looking at this. If you sit up tonight and eat a whole lemon cream pie, that's gluttony. You can say, God, forgive me, but God's not going to make you skip the calories, my friends. You're going to get fat off that pie. I don't care what happens. You're going to put the you're going to put the pounds on, and God ain't going to take them off. You're going to deal with it. Again, God is not going to forgive you. He's not going to for, let me say He's not going to forgive what He's told you. He's going to cause you to reap. There's no need. It's not it's not the same thing. Corruption is the natural God given response to sowing to your flesh. Worship is not connected to corruption. Worship is based on forgiveness. Why do I worship God? Because my sins have been forgiven. I give him glory because he forgave me of my sins. And fellowship comes when I'm right with God. It's not based on the corruption I'm having to deal with in my life as a result of my own doing. I want to give you four truths 
about reaping corruption. Four truths about reaping corruption. Everybody, everybody under the sound of my voice needs to hear this. So listen close. Again, you can be in full fellowship with God while you reap corruption. You can have communion with the Lord, be in sweet fellowship with him while you're going through the reaping of the corruption in your life. I mentioned this in Sunday school because it was in our text, but there are plenty of preachers in America who have embezzled thousands or even millions of dollars from their churches, had sex with a minor, were prosecuted, and sit in a penitentiary having sought and found forgiveness from the Lord and having fellowship with God, but they are going to finish their prison sentence. God ain't going to let them out and give them a pulpit back because they said they were sorry. They are going to have to pay for what they did. They're going to have to suffer in their flesh. Will God send them to hell for what they did? No. If they have have forgiveness from him, no, they've still got a place in heaven. But they are going to live with it in this life. Corruption cannot be forgiven. It can only be reaped out. Corruption cannot be forgiven. It can only be reaped out. Like I said earlier, an unexpected pregnancy, a terrible accident, an injury due to self-abuse or mental harm done through drug or alcohol use. All those things can be forgiven, but God's not going to take away the corruption. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God and everybody else in your life may forgive you. You may have committed some horrible, atrocious sin, and your wife may have left you, and your kids may say, I ain't going to ever speak to him again as long as I live. And you may win your wife back, and you may get your kids back, and God may forgive you, and things, things may be okay in your life, but I can guarantee you, everything will not be put back the way it was before you sowed to your flesh because you're going to reap corruption in your life. It has to be reaped. Number three, corruption is always reaped in the flesh. Always reaped in the flesh. It does not affect my eternal standing in heaven. Nothing down here after I'm saved is going to affect my eternal standing in heaven. Corruption is a time-bound problem. The day they put you in that hearse and haul you to the cemetery, your days of corruption are over. You don't have to worry about it anymore. It will always be reaped in your flesh. But the problem, here's the problem. Here's the real problem. I said corruption is always reaped in the flesh. The problem, though, is it might not be your flesh. You may make it through this life without reaping your corruption. But if you have children, if you have grandchildren or great-grandchildren, they may end up reaping what you have sown. You see, some time may pass between sowing to the flesh and the reaping of corruption. And I don't under, pretend to understand everything that this verse is saying, but I, but I can read what it says. Numbers fourteen eighteen says, The Lord is long-suffering, of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Again, I don't pretend to understand everything that verse is saying, but I do read what it says. Let me give you a little example of what I'm trying to say here. I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard of Matt's Wild Cherry Tomatoes, but they're some of the best cherry tomatoes you could ever plant. They're about the size of a little little cat's eye marble, one of those little small ones. Not the big ones, but the little ones, ones you shoot, you know, when you're a kid. I know kids don't do that anymore, but when I was a kid, I had some marbles. But, man, those things just as red and just as sweet. My granddaughter, when she was about five or six years old, my granddaughter, Valerie, she used to stand over there beside my house and just picking them off and just eating them like candy. She loved them things. Now, she's 14 now. 
So that was about eight years ago. Every year since I planted those tomatoes, actually, I take that back. I planted those tomatoes somewhere around 2012, before she was that age. Every year since I planted those wild matched, uh, matched wild cherry tomatoes, they have come back in a different location. Every year. I ain't planted them since 2012. But every year they come back somewhere else than I planted them. How's that happening? Well, birds is eating them and they go on over sitting and squatting and then there's another tomato plant. But what I'm trying to say is I didn't plant that. I didn't ask for that. I didn't wish for that. They just come up on their own. I planted six collard green plants three years ago. Do you know those things kept producing and overwintering for three years? And this last year, when this last winter, when it got so brittle, bitter, so bitter, you know, bitter cold, and everything had a hard freeze, both of them died, and they turned black, and they withered and dried up. And I had a big old stalk about this long coming up out of my out of my flower bed where that thing had grown for three years, and that thing was dry and hollow, had bugs crawling out of it. And Miss Joanne, about a, about March. I saw this little bitty green sprout come up out of the ground on the side. About this long. And now there's some collard green plants sitting there about this big around. Some of the biggest, most luscious leaves you've ever seen in your life. Now, how'd that happen? I didn't have nothing to do with it. I'm still reaping something I did years ago. Didn't mean to. Didn't try to. Didn't ask for it showed up later than I thought it would. See, I see the repetition of some of my youthful sins in my own children. I see them doing some of the foolish things I did, committing some of the same sins. I see them struggle with some of the same sins and some of the same things that I not only have to live with, but I've warned them about. They're still living with it. You ever been around somebody that likes to do a lot of bragging about how they used to live before they got saved? Oh, I was wild, man. I was wild back then. Woo, we used to, boy, we used to really get into some stuff back I hear people talk like that. That's dangerous talk. You know, it ain't over till it's over. And evidently it ain't over because you're still bragging about the things that you did. And just as sure as the sun's going to rise in the morning, he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. It's coming. It's coming. You just haven't got there yet. But it's coming. Number four, you cannot be so filled with the Holy Spirit of God that you no longer reap corruption. <clears throat> Ephesians 5.18 says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You can be a Holy Ghost filled, shouting, serving, soul winning child of God, and that won't stop you from reaping corruption. And you can't become such a super Christian that God goes, okay, well, I'll turn the water up on that. No, if he did, he wouldn't be God because he wouldn't be doing what he said he'd do in his word. You can be filled with the Spirit of God at the same time that you are reaping corruption. Did you know that lots of preachers have lots of trouble in their lives? Did you know that? Preachers have all kinds of trouble in their lives. There's plenty of preachers who lived with the devil before they got saved, and now they're having to reap the corruption that they sowed. And they still got, listen, they got to get up every morning and, and, and get right, and make sure they're right, their lives are right with God, fill with the Holy Ghost, get in the pulpit and preach the Word of God. And when you're in the pulpit, listen, there ain't no corruption when you're in the pulpit. God's hands on you. But when you step out of it and go back into Monday morning, the devil may meet you right there in the middle of the yard. Believe you me, just because somebody is, is, is holy in their manner of conversation does not mean they're not reaping corruption in their life. This passage is not there to scare God's people. The passage is here to help God's people to understand you can't avoid reaping corruption. But corruption is good. I know y'all thought, what? How can it be good? You sure you said that? Did I hear you right? You heard me right. Corruption is good. And I know you're asking yourself, how in the world can corruption be good for a believer? 
Glad you asked me. I'm going to tell you. Corruption is good, number one. Get your pencil ready. Because God helps others through your pain. God helps others through your pain. Hear what I'm going to say. This can help you. This can transform your life. Hear what I'm going to say. Your greatest pain can become your greatest ministry. Your greatest pain can be your greatest ministry. Where you have been hurt, you now have authority. Where you have been hurt, and you're, you can't speak on something you've never been through. But when you've been hurt, man, I've been through it. I know what that feels like. i got some authority on this subject. I have got a college education class on pain. Where you have suffered, you now have a voice. You couldn't speak on it before, but you've lived through it now. So, yes, you are an authority on the subject. If you commit this sin, you're going to suffer this way. This is what you don't want to do. God gave me a royal college class on that. And I'm still going through it. Where you have endured your greatest agony, you have the most authority. Let me tell you about some people. Some people that I know, people that Mom knows very well. In Paris, Texas, Roger and Vicki Powell. Roger and Vicki Powell, I've heard their testimony. Uh, they they have the Paris Pregnancy Care Center in Paris. Paris Pregnancy Care Center is a place where women who are pregnant, who, uh, who are thinking about getting an abortion, can go and get some counseling and, and hopefully be introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved and then decide to keep their faith. It's also a place where uh, young mothers can go and find very, very cheap, 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 uh, baby clothes and things of that nature, and diapers and all kinds of things, all kinds of help, okay? Roger and Vicky, they had a baby. It was unexpected. They got an abortion a long time ago. Now, I don't remember all the testimony, but I can tell you this. They went through a lot of pain as a result of it. And they took that pain and they turned around and they invested it in helping other people who were going through the same thing. And God has blessed that ministry in a powerful way. They, you know, tell, there's no telling how many people have been saved as a result of the pain that Vicki Powell went through as a result of the abortion she, she went through with. Her and Roger have helped countless, countless children to be sure to come into this world and have a chance at life with a mother who knows Christ now. What a tremendous, powerful ministry. Why? Because God help other people through the pain that they endured. Corruption can be good. Number two, corruption is good because you prove that God's word is the authority and that he will do exactly what he said he will do. You're proving the word of God is true because you're going through it. My own dad is a testimony to this truth. Back in 1998, I was gone to Bible college. I got a phone call. Your daddy's got cancer in his lung. Don't know what they're going to do. They went in. They they, they, they did radiation. They, they shot it into the tumor, exploded the DNA in the tumor. What, the tumor is what they called it. And uh, and that shrunk. He lost one lung. He was going to be all right. Until he, they, they were gonna, he was going to go back to work. Everything was great. And he went back in for a PET scan. They found spots on the other lung. He just said, I'm going home. I'm not going to do anything else. We found out he had cancer. He drove down to Glory Baptist Church and had to talk with Pastor Bill Dickey. He wanted to make sure he was saved. My dad lived lived like a he lived like a hellion most of his life. He got smitten in his heart, and he knew he, he knew he knew he he knew he was. I don't I don't. If my dad ever got saved, he had lived such a worldly backslid life. He he. Thought he had to go get saved again, or if he wasn't saved again, with needless to say, he went and he went and got saved. And you know that's what he wanted to make sure of, and, and he found peace with God concerning his sins. But that didn't take his cancer away. And just like it was yesterday, I could see myself sitting in that room with him. He had a desk in there, called it his office. He worked. He was a DJ at the radio station. He 
prepare his jokes and stuff and his stories in there before he go up there and do them. And, and uh, anyway, I'm sitting by his desk, and he's sitting over in the corner. And he just kept saying, boy, wouldn't it be something? God healed me. Wouldn't it be something? God took away my cancer and healed me. And I would have liked nothing better than for God to take away his cancer and heal him because I knew he was he was a different man at that point. But I knew in my heart that God was going to let corruption do its work because of the life he'd lived. And he was going to reap that corruption, and he did. And I watched him take his last breath before he went out into eternity, and the corruption was gone. Number three, corruption is good because it stops you, the believer, from wanting to continue on in sin. Hey, it stops you from wanting to continue in sin. So corruption is good. Again, I asked you about hot stoves and cigarette lighters, but let me ask you this. How many of you in here ever tried to eat a green persimmon? Got one, two, three. How many of y'all had two of them? Nobody? Nobody tried a second one? Oh, come on. We learn the hard way, don't we? We sure do. Corruption's good. How terrible do we live in our flesh? We never had any consequences for our sin. Think about it. If we never had to pay in our flesh, we'd do whatever we wanted to do. Some people do anyway and curse God whenever things, bad things happen to them because they don't understand this principle. We need to learn the hard way. Corruption is good. Fear of corruption falling on your life or your offspring's lives is a restraining fear that's given to us from a holy God who wants us to be holy like he is. He, doesn't, he wants to put that fear in our heart. I don't want what happened, what I did to, to hurt my kids. That ought to be a restrainer. I don't want my grandchildren to have to suffer for what I've done. I don't want, you say, how does that happen, preacher? Influence. Influence. Hey, listen, I'm going to tell you something. If my daddy had never said I can't go to bed at night with one beer floating in that cooler out there, it drives me crazy. My my brother probably wouldn't be an alcoholic. But he, you know what? He was around it constantly. That's just a wonder I had. Corruption passes on. Old or young, rich or poor, holy or worldly, male or female, it is good for you to reap corruption because it makes you to where you don't want no more of it. Amen. You say, well, what am I going to do, preacher? What am I going to do? Isn't that what you were waiting for? What am I going to do with all this in my life? That's where we go to Hosea. Hosea 10, turn over there. Here's your answer. Here's your parallel text. <clears throat> Sowing and reaping. Hosea 10, 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground for it's time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness on you. What is that saying? Sow to yourselves in righteousness. The Bible says if you do so, you'll reap in mercy. You see, here's the thing. You can't control what you reap, but you can control what you sow. You can't control what comes up, but you can control what is being planted. So since you've been saved... You've been planting righteousness. And while you're planting, you're, you're working, planting righteousness, going to church, giving, uh, serving God, trying to tell people about Jesus, trying to be a better person, my family, and trying to do all the things I can. What in the world is this in my life? Oh, this is corruption. You can't help that. You can't help what's going to come up. You just keep on planting righteousness while the corruption is coming up in your life. See, I mean, people get confused. They start questioning God's goodness for allowing these things to come into their life or the life of a loved one. They say, why, God, why are you allowing this to come into my life? Well, you start to see it. 
Is it starting to become clear why bad things happen in your life and happen in the lives of those you love? Bad things happening to slave people? Why does that happen? Starting to understand? He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And while that's taking place, rather than you cursing God, getting mad and quitting, go to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. See, the only thing that's going to help you is the mercy of God. That's all that's going to help you. Amen? Nothing else. No matter what you have to reap, listen to me, no matter what you've got to reap in your life, the mercy of God will get you through it. It'll give you help, it'll give you patience, it'll give you courage, and it will give you sustaining power. Now look up here, I'm going to give you four more things. Four things that you need to do if you want to reap in mercy. These are, these are important. Better make sure you got them. Number one, don't get mad at God. Don't get mad at God. Don't dig yourself an even deeper hole than you are in. God is your only hope. Why would you get angry at God for acting according to his word and doing exactly what he said he was going to do? Don't get mad at God. Number two, don't hide from your past. Now, I don't mean... If you need to go around, you live a terrible life, you've done some bad things, you like to go around vomiting on everybody, all the bad things you've done, all that. Nobody wants to hear that, nobody needs to hear that. But let's just say you did some terrible things in your past and you get saved and you run into somebody who says, Hey, ain't you that guy you threw, did all the rest stuff back then? Yeah, that's me. Don't blame God. Say, That was me. I did it. I chose it. Praise God, I ain't that way anymore. But be willing to admit it. Don't hide from it. Again, don't vomit your sins on the public, but be willing to admit if you're questioned about it. Amen? Don't make excuses because that won't help you reap out your corruption. If you try to hide from it or make excuses for why you did it, just own up to it and move on. Number three, keep on sowing in righteousness. If you look at verse 9 in our text in Galatians chapter 6, it says, And let us not be weary in well-doing. That's so in righteousness. Don't stop so in righteousness. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Reaping corruption while you sow righteousness, it, it, it's a hard road to hoe. But here's the thing. God promises that it'll get better as we keep going. And you know what? Again, you've got to reap that bad stuff out. But eventually you'll get to the down toward the end of the road where there's mercy. Where there's mercy. God promises to help you. You just keep on sowing. Number four, it's right for you to ask for mercy. It's right. It's proper. The same God that put mercy into a mother's heart is the same one that we ask for mercy. The same mercy that God gave to a grandmother is the same mercy that God has in abundant supply. You think about how you think about any of us in here, especially if it was boys, fell off our bicycle, got rocks embedded into our knee, went in the house screaming with blood running down our legs. Did Mama scold you? She take you up in her arms and pick it out and wash it out and clean it up and blow on it after she put the monkey blood on it. <laughs> she took care of you, didn't she? She loved you. She didn't tear you up for it. That's the same love that God put into her heart. God put that there, and God has that kind of mercy for us. But God's going to let us reap what we got to reap. Listen to the man after God's own heart. Psalm eighty-six, fifteen. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. I'm mindful of Psalm 136. Psalm 136 has 26 verses in it. They're all verses of praise. And each one ends with the phrase, for his mercy endureth forever. Twenty-six times over and over, for his mercy endureth forever. If we come to him and we say, Father, help me. I need mercy. I'm reaping corruption. You know what he'll do? He'll send his Holy Spirit, the comforter, 
to give us mercy. And he'll get you through it. He'll get you through it. The corruption that you're having to reap, he'll get you through it. See, the devil ain't going to help you at all. No, if you walk away from God mad, you say, I'm tired of this. I'm doing God ain't helping me. You think the devil's going to help you? It's going to get worse and worse and worse. God is the only help you've got. Don't get weary just because you're paying for what you did. Don't get mad at him. Don't listen to the devil. I urge you this morning, listen, if God has dealt with you, God's shown you something in your life. God's shown you some reasons for why you're going through what you're going through. Or if you've got some things that you know you haven't reached out and you're afraid it's going to land in your children's life, whatever it is, come and bring it to God and let's, let's let him have it. He loves you. He wants to help you through this. He wants to get us through this. We need him in this hour we're living in. Come and bring it to God. Let's turn it over. Sister, come on to the piano. Let's come and bring things to God. Let's don't keep holding on to these things. Let's don't let these things make us bitter on the inside. Let's let God do his work in us. I'm telling you, I know good will. Listen, I've, I've been through some pain in my life. I'm still living through some pain in my life as a result of the things that I did in my past. But I thank God for his mercy. I'm going to tell you, it's been good. It's been good. It's been good to me. God's been good in spite of what I've done. Again, we don't need to ask Him to forgive us for the things that we're reaping. But we don't need to ask Him for mercy to get them. Let's go a little bit. Father, I just pray you help us now. Holy Spirit, God, work in us and through us. Lord, I pray if there's some things that we need to do business with you about, some things we need to come and, and, and confess to you, Lord, maybe some things we need to come and ask for mercy. Lord God, I pray that, that this invitation, Lord, would be used for that purpose. Pray, Father, that you work and do the work in the lives of your people. Father God, make yourself a presence real to us this day. And we'll give you the glory for it. We'll thank you and we'll praise you for being so good and being honest and being good of your word, Father. Thank you, Lord. Help us and use us. Let Lord may the may the things that we've caused and that come into our lives, may we you turn around and use them. Lord, for your honor and glory that we might bring help into somebody else's life and to be a channel of blessing to somebody else. Maybe that's the need this morning. I don't know the need, Father, but whatever it is, Lord, I know the Spirit of God is able to think the me. And may we come to this day. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 155. Have thine own way. Let God have his way in your life this morning. Have thine own way. Let God have his way in your life this morning. Absolute. 